according to the computer, and that will start. All right, so female reproductive system, there are gonna be some obvious differences between a male and female reproductive system, right? But in terms of the gametes, in terms of, right, the, the gonads, there are gonna be some similarities as well. So we're talking about, especially when we start talking about chapter 29, when we talk about how we mature from a fetus all the way to a baby to an adult, especially in utero, there's some pretty interesting things that happen, right? Now, when we talk about the female pelvis right here, again, I kind of mentioned it in class, take a look at where the bladder is and take a look at where the uterus is. You can imagine that if you have a baby, it doesn't have to be a big baby, right? If you have any baby that is growing in the uterus, what's gonna happen? You're gonna push down on that bladder quite a bit, right? So there's a reason why moms and pregnant mothers will have this incontinence issue. And it usually starts after the first trimester. Remember, as soon as you hit the second and the end of the second trimester, most of the development of the baby is gonna be finished. You're gonna have all the fingers, you're gonna have all the toes, things like that. What's gonna happen after the second trimester is baby's just gonna grow in size and gain weight. As the baby grows in size and gain weight, you can imagine it's gonna push on that bladder quite a bit. And if you take a look at this ovary right here, the ovary itself, when you have a, a newborn baby girl, newborn baby girl that has yet to have ovulation. The ovary should be nice and smooth, kind of like what we see in the male testes. But with many rounds of ovulation, remember, for males, production of sperm is a very simple thing. You have the seminiferous tubules that are formed by those sustentacular nurse uh, Sertoli cells, Three names for one cell, I know, right? And those cells are going to guide your stem cells. So then they can undergo meiosis and turn into four sperm cells. Easy, you just drop those sperm cells right into the lumen of the seminiferous tubules. They'll go into the epididymis where they will receive their acrosome or they will you know, make their acrosome, make a more functional flagellum. And next thing you know, the sperm is ready to go. So there's nothing kind of violent or you don't have to burst anything to form that those sperm cells. For females though, it's a little bit more violent, right? It's gonna be, you're gonna have ovulation and you're gonna actually have to burst through the, the membrane, the cortex, right? The, you know, the cortical layer of the ovary so then you can bring that ovulated egg into the fallopian tube. So there's a little bit more, uh, it's not quite as easy as it is in males. Males, we kind of get off easy in just about all of this, all right? So I do apologize. Now, with the ligaments and ovaries, we kind of talked about it in class yesterday. The uterus is over here. This area is the body. This is a fundus. The cervix is this whole area of the uterus that kind of meet that kind of meets with the vagina. And what we're going to see is that in terms of the cervix, everybody assumes the cervix is just the opening. That is not, right? The opening of the cervix is called the os. So we have the cervical os and external os, which is closest to the vagina, and an internal os, which is deep into the uterus, excuse me. Now, since the uterus itself isn't gonna be, is kind of small and it needs to be kind of kept in place so then it doesn't just move around. We have a lot of these ligaments kind of holding everything in place. So one of the bigger ones are the broad ligaments right here. The broad ligament is gonna connect your uterus, your fallopian tube, to your posterior and lateral abdominal walls. Then on the fundal side right here, we should have also round ligaments that allows us to hold the fundus of the uterus to the anterior abdominal wall. And remember that the actual structure of the ovaries right here 
it's not completely embedded on the fallopian tube. So what we're going to see is that they're not kind of linked up together. They're not sutured in place, not, nothing like that. So what happens is that even though there's a tight meeting between the ovary and the fallopian tube, you still need to hold the fallopian tube and the ovary in place. That's where we'll get the uh, ovarian ligaments, the suspensory ligament that goes from the opposite side as well. Again, all these ligaments are to make sure, number one, when you have ovulation, the ovulated egg, ovulated follicle, will then be released directly into the fallopian tube. As it goes into the fallopian tube, then the fallopian tube is held in place to the uterus by the broad ligament. And now there's no shifting, there's no ripping. And now the uh, follicle that has been ovulated can go through the isthmus and hopefully implant on the uterus. Now, when we look about the histology of the ovary right here, again, much different than in the male reproductive system. If you take a look at this picture, it's kind of bumpy and lumpy right here, right? And the bumps and lumps are due to numerous rounds of ovulation and then healing as a response to it. Remember, when you ovulate, you're going to actually have to burst through the cortex here. And that's going to be a, you know, a semi-violent process. Now, what we're going to take a look is that the ovary histology is that they're going to be divided into a superficial layer closer to the, the membrane region right here, and then an internal region that we call the medulla. The superficial region is what we call the cortex. So you have a cortex region where all of your ooze sites are found. And then each month, one of the many ooze sites starts to grow bigger. It starts to go get much, much larger. It finishes meiosis. And then as it enlarges, it starts producing a little bit of fluid and a lot of estrogen. The estrogen that these cells all start to produce, well, estrogen's a hormone. So you need to release it into the bloodstream, right? So here's the bloodstream. The medulla area is where we're gonna have the blood vessels that brings in LH, that brings in FSH, all right? The FSH allows each follicle to then get stimulated each month. Right? As it gets stimulated and grows, it turns into a mature or graphian follicle. Two things happen. As it matures, these follicles start to produce more and more and more estrogen. The estrogen they produce starts being secreted into the bloodstream by the blood vessels found in the medulla. The more estrogen we have, remember at medium, moderate to low levels of estrogen, there's inhibition of FSH and LH. But at high levels, like when we have a mature follicle, the estrogen levels spike. As they spike, that is when we will see ovulation, right? Now, what we're gonna see is those cells that are found in the ovary as the follicle starts to mature and grows. Some of those cells immediately surrounding the oocyte some of them will be ovulated out with the oocyte. A lot of it stays in the ovary. And under the help of LH, it allows those cells to reconsolidate, heal, and turn into a kind of a hormone producing organ called the corpus luteum. It becomes glandular tissue that starts producing another hormone some of you might have heard of, and that's progesterone. Right, so before ovulation, <clears throat> the main hormone we're going to talk about in the ovary is estrogen. After ovulation, the same cells that produced estrogen pre ovulation, those cells stay in the ovaries and now they're going to switch to making progesterone post ovulation. Now, we'll keep talking about that in just a few minutes. So if you didn't get that, we'll have some graphs. We'll have some uh, diagrams that discusses it as well. A couple things. With the eugenesis and eugonia, right? 
Ugenesis is a production of secondary oocytes in the ovaries. Ugonia are cells from which oocytes develop. Those are stem cells. Remember, we have something like that in the sperm. We call it spermatogonia. Spermatogonia is going to turn into sperm cells. But before that, they're primary stem cells. Ugonia divide by mitosis to produce other ugonia and a primary oocyte. One of the big differences between male and female reproductive meiosis is this. In males, you want to increase the odds of having babies. So you can have increased odds of fertilization. What's the best way to do that is to make as many sperm cells as possible. The more sperm cells that are viable, the greater the number, the better chance that at least the greater chance that one will get through and fertilize the egg. Now, do you want to be able to have to carry four babies? Remember, with meiosis, we should be producing four daughter cells. One stem cell undergoes the cell life cycle. It doubles its DNA to 46 chromosomes times two. Then it undergoes two consecutive rounds of cell division. By the end of meiosis, we should have four haploid 23 chromosome cells. That's true for the males. For the females, the last thing you want when you ovulate is to ovulate four eggs at the same time. That would mean that each time that you have ovulation, there's a chance that you might have quadruplets each time then. That sucks, right? There's not enough room in the abdomen for that to happen. Now, you do hear of instances when it does happen, but it's very uncomfortable to be carrying multiple babies. We are meant to carry one baby at a time. And what happens is, in order to carry just one baby at a time, when we have meiotic <clears throat> cell divisions, right? In males, in meiotic cell division, after meiosis one, you form two 46 chromosome cells. Those two 46 chromosome cells undergo the second round of cell division to form four 23 chromosome cells. Lots of cells, perfect. For females, it's not the truth this way. For females, when they undergo meiosis, that stem cell, right, right before meiosis, has two sets of 46 chromosomes. Under the first round of cell division, one cell, right, undergoes meiosis, and it stays an ugonia. It stays an actual oocyte, right, a complete cell. The other chromosomes that are we're going to produce will actually just be like what we call a polar body, basically a chromosome holder. They're not real cells, right? It's our way of shedding chromosomes without producing an extra cell. So then what happens, right? After the first round of meiosis, you should only have one functional 46 chromosome cell. The other 46 chromosome is just gonna be a polar body, basically chromosomes and a plasma membrane. That's it right? That's there's no organelles, nothing else. So, you know, a polar body is just like a, I would just want you to imagine it's just, just like an empty shell with chromosomes in it. And that's it. So now you have shed that 46 chromosomes with the second round of cell division, the 46 chromosome normal egg undergoes a second round of cell division. In the process, one of those cells stays a cell that becomes a oocyte. The second one, it's a second polar body, another chromosome holder only. This way by going undergoing meiosis in this fashion, we, can, we will produce only one functional cell that can be fertilized. If we have complete meiosis and equal distribution of chromosomes and the organelles and the plasma membrane, and we produce two different cells each time, we're going to produce too many eggs. And now there's a chance you'll be carrying multiples each time you have ovulation. And that's not good, right? So here we kind of mentioned it in our lecture last yesterday. When we look at this, keep in mind, another big difference between male and female meiosis is <clears throat> in males, none of this starts until puberty. You have no sperm cells in the testes. There's very little testosterone, all right, until you hit puberty. 
for females, my, meiosis actually starts really, really early on in life. So what we're going to see is in meiosis, right, you have 5 million oocytes produced by the fourth month of prenatal life. So as a fetus, you already have these four, uh, 5 million oocytes. And then by the time you give birth, right, you have about 2 million. Now, all of those millions of oocytes also start meiosis really early on in gestation, meaning that in males, you don't even start meiosis, you don't start producing sperm. For males, I want you to think of meiosis as sperm formation. So for males, that sperm formation, right, those meiotic cycles, they don't start until puberty. For females, not only do you have more gametes already, more sex cells, those oocytes already present at birth, but you have the, mo the greatest number before birth, and then it, you start shedding those numbers. And not only do we have a lot of those numbers of uh, oocytes, but we also have them start meiosis one. Again, you don't ever complete the meiosis one until later on, but every single one of the two, three million oocytes start the process of meiosis one. So in the process, they're going to double their chromosome at the synthesis phase. Remember, in the cell life cycle, you go through G1, S, G2, and then the cell division phase, right? Well, all of these 5 million oocytes, they're all going to undergo G1. They're all going to go through S phase and double their chromosomes. They're going to all go to G2, and then they're going to pause at the prophase one of the first meiotic cycle. Now, at puberty, then one of the millions of chromosomes we have at puberty will start to mature. As they start to mature, they're going to be surrounded by granulosa cells. These granulosa cells allows it to become what we call a primordial follicle. Then the primordial follicle will then turn into eventually, right, a secondary follicle and then a mature follicle. Again, right, a follicle is nothing more than an oocyte, the egg, with its support cells now. And here that's kind of showing us the, you know, what happens in meiosis, right? So you have this daughter cell, your stem cell. It undergoes G1, S, and G2 in the, you know, we're talking about, you know, this is early on right here, right? That's going to happen as a fetus. So as a baby deep inside mom's uterus, you're going to have these oocytes right here undergo the first cell division, but it's going to pause at prophase one of that first cell division. And then every month, one of the millions that are of those oocytes that have been paused at prophase one, one of them continues and finishes your first meiotic division as it matures, right? After it finishes its first meiotic division, what happens? You produce two unequal cells. One stays an actual viable oocyte. The other one is basically a chromosomes, 46 chromosomes, and a plasma membrane, and that's it, right? We call that a polar body. That becomes nothing. Right? It's just a way of shedding the chromosomes. Now, remember, we need to only have 23 chromosomes in the oocyte because we're going to have 23 chromosomes coming from the egg, uh, from the sperm cells. Right? So right here, it says we have 23 chromosomes. But keep in mind, after the first meiotic cycle, right, there's 46 chromosomes right at the very start. It's 46 double arm chromosomes. That means you've got the genetic material for 92 chromosomes. But since the other half of the chromosomes are attached, they don't count as separate chromosomes. So what happens after the first meiotic cycle? It says here you have 23 chromosomes. Yes, you have 23 chromosomes, but each of those chromosomes that are 23 are double arm chromosomes attached to each other in the middle, meaning that once we separate those two, 
right? The, the double arm chromosomes, they count as separate chromosomes again. But when they're attached, they only count as one. In other words, when you see this 23 chromosomes in your head, I want you to think that's not 23. It's actually 46 chromosomes. That's the only way this makes sense, right? So <clears throat> what happens? After you finish prophase one, metaphase one, anaphase one, telophase one, and now you have formed complete cell here, right? This 23 chromosome that have double arm, that oocyte ruptures through and gets ovulated out. Now, for women, the only time meiosis is ever completed, only time is when there is fertilization. When you have a sperm cell come in here and it penetrates through the plasma membrane of that oocyte, immediately the oocyte then will undergo the last round of cell division. So, right, the first round occurs before ovulation. And then the last round of cell division occurs if there's fertilization. If there's penetration of the sperm cell, through the plasma membrane of the oocyte. Once that penetration occurs immediately, all right, you undergo the second round of cell division, you shed the extra arm of our 23 chromosome, and now we only have 23 chromosome single arm cells, right? And now you have 23 chromosomes here in the oocyte, 23 chromosomes here in the sperm cell. Now you have the two sets of 23 that we see in all of us as a zygote, right? One set of 23 for mom, one set of 23 from dad. Perfect. Now, in terms of ovulation, and we'll kind of move back and forth here, right? Ovulation releases a secondary oocyte from the ovary, right? Unlike spermatogenesis, with ovulation and with meiosis, formation of the or, you know, the effects of meiosis one is that we have polar bodies that are formed, right? Non-functional cells that's main purpose is to shed chromosomes. The graphene follicle ruptures, graphene means mature follicle, it ruptures. Then you'll have the release of the oocyte into the fallopian tube. The remaining granulosa cells turns into the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum, we'll see, will start producing progesterone. So I'm going to come back to this in a second. So I want to go into an actual, let me see, right here. And we kind of mentioned this uh, chart, this diagram yesterday in our class. And I just want to get a full, uh, big picture part of this right here. Now, what happens each month? At Menarchy. Menarchy is our first menstrual bleeding. Now keep in mind, right? In order to have menses, you would have already had ovulation that month before. So there is a small, small, small possibility that a young girl who might not know that she can even have, you know, get pregnant because she's never had menses before. Well, if she's sexually active at that young age, there's a chance that she can get pregnant even though she's never had menses. Because that month before you actually have the menstrual bleeding, you're actually ovulating, right? So the only time you have menses is if you have ovulation. And it requires a steady amount of body fat for us to have ovulation. Now, I know for women, right? Amenorrhea can be a problem in people who are on bad diets or athletes, right? Athletes. Now, what happens? In order for women to have this menstrual cycle, you need to have great enough body fat, right? A body fat of at least 20%. So then you can have this cycle continue. Most of you guys have heard of, you know, just in general population or God forbid, if you have a friend that undergoes this, right? The friend that has an eating disorder. And now with the eating disorder, they have a hard time. They don't want to eat, right? They have anorexia. They're real thin, or God forbid, they make themselves vomit after they eat. So then they don't absorb the nutrients. 
Well, people who are that thin do not have enough body fat so that menses can occur. If menses doesn't occur, it's also a sign that you don't have ovulation. So amenorrhea right here, right? Can be a sign that you're on some contraceptives. It can also be a sign of somebody that has major issues with their diet, or it doesn't even have to be something bad. If you're an athlete, right? The, the women's uh, US soccer team, right? The, USM, the USWMT, right? Our women's soccer team is awesome. They win World Cups. They're, they're amazing, right? The thing about all these women is they're practicing so intensely and so often that their body fat is too low. So low that if they want to have babies and they want to have a family, the only way that can happen is if they actually stop playing and stop training, right? While they're training, the body fat is too low. They, this whole cycle shuts down. If this whole cycle shuts down, there's no ovulation. So then there's no pregnancy. So you need a steady body fat amount. The greater the body fat, the more likely you are to have a steady flow, uh, to have a steady pattern here. Now, let's talk about this chart, and then we're going to see how it relates in the pituitary gland to the, what relates in the ovary and how it relates to the uterus. So what happens is this, right? When we're looking at this, I don't think you can see my cursor. I'm just going to end the show and just blow it up a little bit this way that, right? I need the, there's my cursor, right, right here. So when we are looking at our first menstrual flow, right, what happens? This day 28, when there's a start of menses, that last day of our cycle, then at that date, we cycle back to the first day of the new month, right? So 28 days, and then what happens? After 28 days, we cycle back to day one right here, right? And at day one, our LH and FSH levels are pretty high right? And if we want to go even before that, right? Let's say you just hit puberty. You just hit puberty, the hypothalamus releases GnRH. GnRH is gonadotropin releasing hormone. Your gonads for the females are the ovaries. So the GnRH is going to stimulate the ovaries. GnRH does this stimulation by activating the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland then releases LH and FSH. Those are our gonadotropins. They're the ones that actually directly stimulates our ovaries here and the uterus. So once you have LH and FSH release, now you have this high levels, right? Of LH in green and FSH in brown. What happens? It causes one follicle to start to develop. As a follicle starts to develop, the granulosa cells that surrounds the follicle starts to produce a lot of estrogen, right? Now, at first, it's very low. Why? It's because those granulosa cells are consolidating right now. The follicle isn't mature yet, but as the follicle starts to grow, there's a fluid-filled antrum that develops. As a follicle starts to grow in size and finishes up meiosis, meiosis one, right? It starts producing more and more estrogen. The follicle does. These granulosa cells does. As you have more and more estrogen produced, the estrogen right here starts to allow the uterus to kind of recover its endometrial lining. So the endometrial lining is really, really small, really thin after our menses. And now we need to build it back up, right? We need a nice plush endometrial lining so then the fetus can implant. So what happens? The estrogen not only is a sign of a maturity of the follicle, it also goes in to your uterus, allowing the uterus to then reform the endometrial lining for this month. At the same time, the estrogen levels goes back in a positive feedback form 
So then you can have increased release of LH. Remember what I mentioned, moderate levels of estrogen is actually gonna inhibit LH, but high levels of estrogen causes a positive feedback loop. So then you'll have increased LH and then a spike in LH. And that's what we see here, right? Estrogen levels start to increase rapidly at about the 10th day. At about the 13th day, it spikes, right? What happens then? Well, LH then, as uh, at about the 10th, 11th day, LH, the pituitary gland senses that increase in estrogen and it causes a huge rise in LH. That rise in LH then spikes right at about 14th day, right? In other words, about a day, 18 hours after the estrogen spikes. This LH spike then is caused by the estrogen spike in a positive feedback form. What happens then? The LH spike is what triggers ovulation, right? The only reason the estrogen spikes is because a follicle has matured. Now, right, as a mouth, we know the follicle's matured, we need to be able to ovulate it outwards. This is why the LH spike occurs after the estrogen spike. The LH spike causes the ovulation of that oocyte and some of its close support cells. Now, what happens, right? The cells that don't go and follow the actual oocyte, those cells stay in the ovary and under the help of LH turns into glandular tissue, we call the corpus luteum. This corpus luteum then, there's a switch. Instead of producing estrogen to that high level now, now we're gonna produce progesterone. Right, so the corpus luteum is formed from the cells of that mature graphene follicle. Right, the cell that stays in the ovary turns into the corpus luteum. We know those cells can make estrogen, right? And because of that, and we saw it make estrogen before, right? After we see it make progesterone. Progesterone allows the endometrial lining to stay stable in the hopes that if there is, remember, at this point, we have that ovulated egg. So there's a chance that you might have fertilization and you might have a baby going down the fallopian tube. Well, what happens? We want the baby to be able to implant on that really big, plushy right, endometrial lining where then it can tap into mom's blood vessels, right? So what happens? We want to maintain the endometrial lining. So then, right, the forming zygote can implant. In order to do that, we need progesterone to stabilize the endometrial lining. That's why you see such a high level of progesterone post ovulation. And we're going to see in pregnancy, progesterone levels stay elevated until the last month of pregnancy, right? Now, at labor and delivery, there's a noticeable drop in progesterone and a noticeable spike in estrogen. So we know as a fact that progesterone then is the hormone of pregnancy. It is the only thing we can give somebody to give a woman that has premature labor, right? We give them high dose of progesterone in the hopes that we can stabilize the endometrium and prevent an early all right, labor and delivery. Right, so again, estrogen produced by the gran uh, granulosa cells causes an LH spike, causes ovulation. Once that ovulated oocyte, along with some of its support cells, travels into the fallopian tube, there's a chance of pregnancy. So what we're gonna see is that the cells that stayed in the ovary consolidates, turns into corpus luteum. They start producing progesterone at very high levels in the hopes that if there is fertilization, then the endometrial lining stays full. So then there's easier way of it to implant on the endometrium. Now, what happens if there is no pregnancy? If there's no pregnancy, then what we will see is that the corpus luteum starts to die off and degenerates. As it degenerates, 
it turns into what we call the corpus albicans, right? As it degenerates, the progesterone levels drop significantly. The estrogen levels even here drop significantly. When both of these levels drop significantly, our LH and FSH levels are no longer inhibited, right? Remember, moderate levels of estrogen inhibits both. That's why you see it pretty low right here. Now, the reason why it should make sense, right? There's a chance at this point in our two week cycle here, there's a chance that there's a fertilization. fertilization. There's a chance that if there is fertilization, that it can, the, you know, zygote can implant on the endometrial lining. Would we want at that point a high level of FSH and LH so then we can make another follicle so we can have another round of ovulation, all right? When there's already a growing zygote, no, right? Now that does happen every now and then where you have a baby that's already implanted here and then for some reason or another, LH and FSH stays elevated and now you have, right, a follicle form while there's already a baby in the uterus, right? When that happens, right? You can have ovulation maybe a month, maybe two months after the first baby is implanted. The problem then is, well, if you have ovulation and mom and dad are still having sex, there's a chance that you can have that fertilized egg that then implants on a different part of the uterus. And now we have two babies, one, two to three months older than an other baby, right? And when you give birth, guess what? You can't pick and choose which one stays. They're both going to be exiting. So you might have a baby, one that's full term, and the other baby is going to be maybe seven, eight, six months old, and that's it. There is that chance of that happening. It's not common because when as progesterone levels are high, when estrogen levels are kind of moderate or low, you're going to inhibit LH and FSH, right? So then there's hopefully a decreased chance of this happening where you still have LH and FSH spike, you still have ovulation, all while we're already having a baby in utero. And that's not a good you know, thing to happen. All right, give me one second. Now, what happens if there is, now when we kind of discuss this, I want you to think about what happens if there is pregnancy and then in your same scenario, what happens if there is no pregnancy, right? Let's talk about what happens if there's pregnancy, right? If there's fertilization, we need to make the corpus we need to keep the corpus luteum alive. Now, eventually the baby and the placenta will be the ones that produces the progesterone. But at this point, it's not even a baby yet because it's just a one cell zygote, right? Keep in mind that we have trillions and trillions and trillions of cells. Some people say 45, 50 trillion. Other people say 65, 70 trillion. We can't even decide to the nearest 10 trillions how many cells we have in our body, which is crazy, right? Well, all those trillions of cells come from our initial fertilized egg. And then in order to make those trillions of cells, that fertilized egg has to undergo my, mitosis and then produce two identical daughter cells. And then those two undergo mitosis to form four ident identical cells. Those four undergo mitosis to form eight. You can imagine how many rounds of mitosis until you have enough cells that will become a viable baby, right? In other words, after you know, fertilization, there's no, no place to actually produce progesterone until later on. So we need the corpus luteum to produce that progesterone at least until the second and the end of the second trimester, right? So how do we keep the corpus luteum alive? Simple the growing fetus is gonna start releasing something called HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin. This human chorionic, I'm just gonna write this down. This HCG is also, right? HCG is also 
going to be the hormone that we check for when we think that a woman is pregnant. Now keep in mind, right? The number one, number two rule about emergency medicine is this. If you have a, even a teenage girl, right, that we know could be sexually active, if they complain of abdominal pain, the first thing we do is check to see if they're pregnant. That's true all the time. If you're in that sexually, you know, uh, active range of age from, and nowadays we say from 11 all the way to whatever, right? And you come, you go into the ER complaining of abdominal pain. Immediately, we do a pregnancy test to see if you're pregnant, right? That's going to then guide us to figure out what to do next. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> this HCG when we, is what we test for on the pregnancy test. So if you watch those TV shows for EPT, not, not shows, but the commercials for EPT pregnancy testing, right? Well, the line that develops <clears throat> is supposed to develop when there's a lot of HCG in the urine. That HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin, keeps the corpus luteum alive. Sorry, I got a little frog in my throat here. Um, the corpus luteum then as it stays alive, maintains the integrity of the endometrium by allowing that progesterone levels to stay elevated. So as long as progesterone levels stays very high, you're going to keep the endometrial lining intact. As soon as the progesterone levels drop, you're gonna shed the endometrial lining and anything along with the endometrial lining is shed along with it. And then you'll have menses. Now that happens if there's no fertilization. If the egg and the sperm cells do not fertilize and do not meet, then we don't have HCG being formed. No more positive stimulant, right? When there's no HCG, the corpus luteum dies off and turns into the corpus albicans and turns into scar tissue. At that point, then we are going to, I'm just gonna skip back to where we were, <clears throat> right? At that point then, right? You're going to have menses and you're gonna get ready for the next month. And that's what we see here, right? If there is no pregnancy, there's no, right? HCG being released to keep the corpus luteum alive. Instead, after about two weeks, the corpus luteum dies off. As it dies off, progesterone levels fall off. And now we're gonna shed the endometrial lining. And then at the very start of that shedding, we start the next cycle again. All right, with that cycle, FSH causes one follicle to develop again. That follicle develops, granulosa cells start to produce more and more estrogen, right? And now you have an LH spike, ovulation, progesterone levels increase because of the corpus luteum, keeping intact the endometrial lining in the hopes that you get pregnant the next month. So it becomes one cyclic cycle after another, after another, right? With each end of one cycle, the first day of menses, becoming the first day of the new cycle, <clears throat> all right? Now, if you go to the doctor and you'll go there with your significant other, or you'll go there when you're pregnant, right? And you wanna, you know, doctor will ask you, right? When, and we know you're pregnant, but you might not know how old the baby is in utero. So the doctor will ask, when did you last have your menses, right? When was the last time you had your last menstrual flow? And they take that date from that last menstrual flow as the point at which you were pregnant. Is because after that first menstrual flow, you start a new cycle. And anytime in this first 15 days, you can get pregnant. We don't need to have a specific date, right? Of when it happens. Now, menopause, cessation of menstrual cycles occurring with age. The weird thing is this, right? We kind of talked about it in our class. We have about 500,000 oocytes at the start of puberty. If you are, <clears throat> you know, if let's say you're a nun, right? You're a nun, you've never been sexually active, 
never had kids, nothing like that. What happens if, how many times do you release an egg then, right? How many cycles of this, you know, ovulation and menses do we have? Well, let's say it occurs once every month. And now you first have menarche at 10 and menopause at 50. That's 40 years of continuous release of egg and then menses, right? You will release 12 eggs a year for 40 years. So the most you will release is about 500 eggs. That's it. Remember, we had 500,000. But what happens is each month, you actually activate a lot of oocytes to start to develop. The ones that don't fully develop, they die off. The one that does develop then gets ovulated. So each month, yeah, you, uh, you are going to have FSH, right? FSH is going to activate numerous follicles. The ones that don't turn into the graphian follicle, they die off and you lose those oocytes. Right. So instead of just thinking that, yeah, we only release 500, it's like you release one every month. But in the process of releasing it, you actually activate it, maybe a hundred of them. And then with that hundred, only one fully survives for maturity. The other 99, all right, dies off. And this is why, you know, we can see that, you know, the one, the one uh, ovulated oocyte is going to be the strongest one, hopefully. And then two, right, this is why our population of these oocytes decline so rapidly. Okay, again, review these in terms of how it works, right? <clears throat> it's good to kind of follow through. All right, what does FSH do? FSH causes a follicle to develop. Remember, you're going to stimulate numerous oocytes. Only one fully developed into a mature graphene follicle, which then increases estrogen secretion. LH for the first half of the cycle doesn't do much, right? It helps with maturation. It's only when estrogen levels spike that LH spikes as well, causing ovulation, right? Once you ovulate, the oocyte is flowing through the fallopian tubes. The corpus luteum is formed by the LH, right, helping the granulosa cells stay intact. The corpus luteum produces high, high levels of progesterone. It actually produces some moderate levels of estrogen as well, right? And the high levels of progesterone, moderate levels of estrogen causes a negative feedback here. So then you don't have more LH and FSH. Why? Simple. You already have ovulation, you have an oocyte flowing through the fallopian tube, right? There's a chance you can have fertilization for that month. There's a chance you might have a zygote that implants that month. The last thing we want to do is have more follicles stimulated the following month. And now we might have a baby, might have duck twins, triplets that are basically at least one or two months different in age, right? Now, one or two months different in age now doesn't make a big difference, right? But in utero, that's a huge difference, right? So review this and how it goes. And it kind of allows us to understand the interplay between LH, FSH, estrogen, progesterone, as well as GNRH. GNRH plays a much lesser role after puberty, after menarche. Right. Now, the rest of this kind of explains what happens. So make sure you kind of go over this when you have time. It explains what LHFSH does, right? I kind of went through it just by talking about that chart. Much easier to see a chart. But this next few slides discusses things that happen as a response to progesterone release, estrogen release, right? Now, there are other hormones that we're gonna see in the female reproductive system that play a bigger role in the female reproductive system than the male reproductive system. One of them is relaxin. The other is inhibit, right? Inhibit right here, well, the, the word just tells us what, it's, what it does, right? Inhibit inhibits. What does it inhibit? 
it inhibits further release of FSH and LH. So I want you to think, all right, they're going to release, Inhibit's going to inhibit FSH and LH. When should that happen? Well, it should happen when you have ovulation and you have a chance of pregnancy. The last thing you want is to have another egg release two months later. So inhibit will hopefully prevent that along with estrogen will hopefully prevent that as well, right? It does happen, right? And every now and then you do hear of even uh, an unmarried woman having a fraternal twins of different, you know, color, right? You could have a Caucasian baby and, all right, an Asian, Hispanic, or an African-American baby as well, right, in there. And that happens because for some reason or another, mom was already pregnant, and now there's a second release of an egg. Weird, but it can happen, Right. Um, the only good news is that it's not very common because you can imagine, right? Having the babies, one that's many months older than the other. One's going to be fine when you have labor and delivery. They're fully mature. The other baby is going to be maybe six, seven months of age. And that's it. Six months is about the edge of what we call viability, right? Where the baby then, even if the baby survives, there's a chance of permanent injury as a result of being so young when you have labor and delivery, right? That's why you see so many negative feedback loops here so that we can prevent that. Relaxin, the name itself makes a lot more sense when we start talking about it in the female reproductive system, right? Relaxin relaxes the smooth muscle in the uterus, the myometrium, all right? Allowing it to kind of, you know, allow the baby, the forming fetus to grow inside. And then, right, relaxin is going to be more important at labor and delivery as well, allowing for dilation of the cervical oz. Right. Again, review these many, many slides I kind of discuss. All right. All right. So hold on for one second. All right. I have to let me just pause this. I'm going to need to go to the restroom. So let's take a quick five minute break. I heard my dog howling. We had uh, uh, our sirens went out, right? I think it's a monthly test. The only time my dog ever howls is when the siren goes off. So, right. Um, let's continue here. And we're going to talk about just what happens with pregnancy, what happens with estrogen, progesterone, and the many functions. Now, with estrogen levels right here, remember, estrogens are produced by the ovaries. So, I want you to be able to kind of write that kind of diagram that we did in class. We have hypothalamus release GnRH, then it goes into the pituitary, FSH and LH is released, right? And understand the interplay of estrogen, uh, progesterone in the ovaries and its effect on the uterus and what happens from the actual hormones produced by the ovaries. All right. If you can do that, you're in good shape to understanding just about this whole chapter. Now, if you can do that, you can probably do that as well for the male reproductive system. All right. Again, uh, estrogen, all these different functions increases protein metabolism, increases bone strength and bone density, lowers blood, col uh, blood cholesterol, is protective against MIs and cerebrovascular accidents, which is strokes, lesions, uh, bleeds. Moderate levels of estrogen inhibits GnRH and LH and FSH, but high levels of estrogens are a positive feedback that allows us to have LH spike and then ovulation, right? Progesterone is going to be the main hormone of pregnancy. Its main job is to stimulate memory glands for milk production, and stabilize the endometrial lining, all right? So huge kind of uh, functions of the estrogens. But what happens is this, as women hit men are, uh, menopause, the estrogen levels are just gonna fall off. So up until about 15, 20 years ago, any woman that was on, that was postmenopausal, were almost automatically given hormone replacement therapy. Why? Because we know estrogen 
actually protects against MIs and CVAs. It helps the bone stay strong, right? And it prevents the breakdown of muscle. So lots and lots of very important things estrogen does. So as the levels drop in menopause, most doctors just assume we just give them estrogen and hopefully, and it should kind of counteract, all right, what happens in the body as the estrogen levels fall. So we give them hormone replacement. And what they found out with this huge, huge study was this, right? When we give women that are postmenopausal <clears throat> hormone replacement therapy, that's high in estrogen. Not only did it not protect against MIs and CVAs, it actually increased the probability of strokes and heart attacks. At the same time, right, it actually increased the risk of cancers, right? Cervical cancers, uterine cancer levels were much higher when we compared it with women that were not on hormone replacement therapy. So almost immediately, within a year, just about every woman that I know that was postmenopausal, right? My aunts, my mom, right? My mother-in-law, they were all weaned off hormone replacement therapy, right? <clears throat> it was kind of weird because we, you know, rightly assumed that, well, you know, we have this low level of estrogen. Why don't we give them estrogen? We know estrogen should prevent MIs and CVAs. Well, we give them estrogen exogenously from an outside source, it should also protect from MIs and CVAs. Again, it turned out not to be the case when we actually looked at the studies. We showed that it actually showed increased likelihood MIs and CVAs. At the same time, you have a much greater risk of cancers. So <clears throat> one of the reasons why you don't see anybody basically on hormone replacement post-menopausal anymore. All right, so relaxing and hibbing, we've talked about <clears throat> just a couple you know, slides ago. And here I'm just showing you, <clears throat> sorry, I'm showing you here just the interplay of the hormones. This is very similar to what we saw in a couple slides ago, right? It's just, we put the LH and the estrogen levels, right, into one graph. Here you can see estrogen levels spike at about day 12, and then, day 13, LH level spike. So we can assume that this estrogen spike causes this LH spike. What else do we notice? That after ovulation, right, there's a switch between, right, production of estrogens in green to the production of progesterone in red. Perfect, right? And then after progesterone levels drop, that causes menses. Now, estrogen levels and progesterone levels drop, right? The combination of those two causes menses and it also, right, prevents the inhibition of FSH and LH anymore, right? Before the moderate levels of estrogen, the high levels of progesterone, all inhibited LH and FSH. That's why it's so low here, right? But after the levels start to die off and fall off, then no more inhibition, FSH levels spike, and now we're gonna have one follicle to get stimulated. Well, many follicles stimulate, but only one will mature. All right, so review these and it explains the dates, all right? I do want you to know the things that I highlight in red. So review these, and we kind of discussed it already, so I don't wanna just go through it again. I want you guys to be able to think this through. It should make sense why things are happening the way it should, the way it is. And I mentioned the spike and everything, right? Now, signs of ovulation. You guys have probably watched TV shows, movies, when people want to have get pregnant with their, you know, get pregnant. They want to have a baby. And in the movies and TV shows, they always talk about how they have to take the temperature and everything. And then they have like, you know, two, three hours. And then it's like dramatic where the wife goes, okay, let's go do it now, right? And then the husbands are obvious ready to go, right? And it's in the hopes that you are going to time everything perfectly. And again, it's kind of crazy how there should be increased odds of having a baby with sexual reproduction. 
right? There should be. So what normally happens is we already talked about it in class in the previous lecture with the male reproduction. There's actually part of the seminal fluid that contains fibrin, fibrinogen, right? So you can actually form clots. There's a reason why in order to have sex, you need for the males to have an erection. The erection, right, allows the opening of the penis to be really close to the cervical odds, the opening of the cervix. So then when there's ejaculation, all that seminal fluid, all that sperm gets released right at the opening of the you know, cervical oz. So you not only that, once you have all that seminal fluid in there, you clot it right there. So then all the sperm cells are concentrated right at the opening. Crazy, right? And then you have a clot buster, fibrinolysense, all right, produced by the prostate. And they dissolve the clot after a few minutes, allowing all that concentrated sperm to go up the oz, right? Even the movement that we see in sexual reproduction, right, in sex, is to increase the probability of having a baby. Again, all there to increase the odds of having a baby, right? Now, once you kind of understand how the ovulation cycle occurs, then I want you to think, what happens if there's pregnancy, right? If fertilization occurs and there's pregnancy, then HCG, right, is going to be released by that zygote. HCG then is going to allow the corpus luteum to stay alive and to produce progesterone, all right? So then hopefully by the end of the second trimester, the baby will end the placenta will produce its own progesterone. But in order for that to happen, you need right, a little bit of time and you need a lot of growth of that fetus. Right? It doesn't just happen immediately. Right? The baby is very, very, very small at this point. Right? So you need the corpus luteum to stay intact and that's what HCG does. Now, what happens if fertilization does not occur? No HCG. And after two weeks, the corpus luteum dies off, turns into the corpus albicans. Know what that is, right? And now progesterone levels, estrogen levels drop, causing menses. Now we start the next cycle. Because the levels drop, no more inhibition of FSH and LH because there's no more estrogen and progesterone. So LH and FSH is gonna spike. And the first part is gonna be the FSH causing a follicle to stimulate for the next cycle. The next cycle continues and the follicles start to develop early on as there's menses. All right, so review this and this kind of shows, and I do want you to know the difference between the stratum functionalis, which is a superficial part right here, and the stratum basalis, right? The stratum functionalis is what is shed every month. The stratum basalis is like the stem cell tissue, like the stratum basali of our skin, right? It's that stratum basali, basalis layer that regrows the functionalis layer. So then by the time we have ovulation, the endometrial lining is so plush, so full, it's easy for implantation to occur, right? Now, when menses happens, right, progesterone drops causes these arteries called the spiral arteries to vasoconstrict completely. As they completely vasoconstrict, right, the spiral arteries are no longer bringing blood to the stratum functionalis layer. The stratum functionalis layer is gonna die off. As it dies off, it sheds, all right, along with any blood that's gonna be found in the spiral artery. That's why you see the menstrual flow that is, containing a lot of blood in some people. All right. Now, in terms of, uh, you know, males, right? In order for males to have ejaculation, there needs to be an orgasm, things like that, right? Um, for females, all it requires is that ovulated egg to be in the fallopian tube, right? Sperm cells, as they migrate up the cervical oz, remember, this is the, external oz, this is the internal oz. As sperm cells migrate up to the uterus right here, 
usually, right, for pregnancy to be viable, the sperm is going to fertilize the egg while the oocyte is in the fallopian tube. Why is that important? Simple, right? If you fertilize the egg when the egg right here is in the uterus, by the time that zygote has many rounds of cell divisions, it's able to implant after many rounds of cell division. Well, it's going to be gone, right? It's going to be going out of the uterus already. By having fertilization in the fallopian tube, you allow that zygote to grow as it migrates through the fallopian tubes. By the time it goes into the isthmus and into the uterus now, that zygote, instead of being one cell, is going to be many, many cells all ready to help with implantation. Now, sperm cells undergo a process called capacitation. I'm going to highlight this because I do, and it's already, you know, highlighted. I'm going to underline it just to show you how important it is. Capacitation enables the cell, the sperm cell, to penetrate through the many layers of cells that are kind of protecting the oocyte, right? Remember, the oocyte, as it's ovulated, is not ovulated alone by itself. You have some very, very small layer of support cells that travels with the oocyte. You also have like a gel-like layer of the oocyte we call the corona radiata. That also is a barrier for sperm cell fertilization. So what we need to do is somehow, right, cause the sperm cells to undergo a process where its enzymes found in the head call the acrosome. So we can activate the acrosome. So then the enzyme from the acrosome can digest away the cells and digest that coronaroid radiata. So then you can have fertilization. So the capacitation is the name of a way of enabling the acrosome. And, the, and I'll show you what the acrosome is in a second, right? Like right now, the acrosome, and then hopefully, let me see if I can find it right here. Where? Okay, let me see. Right here. So here's the acrosome right here. Here's the nucleus where we have 23 chromosomes. This region of the head needs to penetrate through. The, acros uh, the acrosome contains enzymes that can digest its way through the coronaradiata, the even work its way through the you know, cells that follows the oocyte as it's ovulated. But the acrosome right here is trapped underneath the plasma membrane. What capacitation does is it kind of breaks apart the plasma membrane. So then the enzymes on the acrosome no longer have a barrier, right? Now there's no more plasma membrane. The enzyme can do its job when it eats its way through the many layers of cells and the corona radiata of the oocyte. I think we're right here and we're almost done, right? Uh, now, the last thing I'll talk, last few things we'll talk about basically um, goes into fertilization. Uh, we do have a chapter 29 that we'll talk about next week and we will have a little bit of class to discuss it next week. Now, what happens if you have a pregnancy and there's no implantation in the uterus, right? We call that an ec ectopic pregnancy. An ectopic pregnancy is when you have a fertilized egg that implants anywhere other than the uterine cavity. The most common place is in the fallopian tube. And then you have a fallopian uh, pregnancy. Or even you might have right an issue here, and then you have ovulation outside of the fallopian tube. And now you have an egg that's outside the fallopian tube, and you have sperm cells that's able to reach the egg, right? Now you might have a baby that's going to be growing in the intra-abdominal cavity, right? All of these ectopic pregnancies are incredibly dangerous, right? Now, most of the time, if you have an ectopic pregnancy in the fallopian tube, you have a lot of blood vessels that are following the fallopian tube. So as the baby grows, the fallopian tube is pretty small, right? As a baby grows, it ruptures 
and it causes hemorrhage and it can cause death, right? Due to the hemorrhage of mom, obviously the baby as well. Now, usually once you have an ectopic pregnancy, we have to terminate that pregnancy just for the health of mom, right? Usually the baby at that point isn't, you know, going to be a baby that can survive anyways. So what are the risk factors with for ectopic pregnancy? One, pelvic inflammatory disease, PID. Pelvic inflammatory disease, right, are infections in the pelvic region, which is either the uterus or the fallopian tube, right? That can cause, right, scar tissue to be formed. As a scar tissue forms in the fallopian tube, the oocyte is too large to get through that scar tissue. But the sperm cells are many magnitudes smaller, right? Sperm cells are much, much smaller than the egg. So the, the sperm cells might work its way through that scar tissue and fertilize the egg. And now that fertilized egg starts to undergo mitosis, grow, and it can't work its way through the scar tissue. You'll implant in the fallopian tube. That's an ectopic pregnancy. Previous abdominal surgeries and even prior DNC, right? A surgical uh, abortions, dilation and cuterage. All of these can increase risk of an ectopic pregnancy. The one that kind of makes sense is an incomplete tubal ligation where we ligate, right? Meaning that we put stitches on one side, put stitches on the other side, and then we cut in the middle. Right. What happens then? You will still be having oocyte that goes that it's form each month, but it just can't work its way through the fallopian tube. If it's a complete tubal ligation, you disconnect the two halves of our uterine or fallopian tube. Right. But sometimes scar tissue can form and you can have now a little miniature connection when they shouldn't be. When that happens, sperm can get through, but the egg can't. And then you have an ectopic pregnancy again. Almost immediately, right, we'll do surgery. And hopefully, you know, we can spare one of the ovaries and one of the fallopian tubes. Right. Now, uh, review fertilization. Fertilization occurs in the uterine tube. Multiple, my, multiple rounds of mitosis occurs immediately after fertilization. Eventually, when you have so many rounds, you'll have cells on the inside and cells on the outside. The cells on the outer layer of our embryonic mass is called the trophoblast. The trophoblast secretes HCG. It also secretes enzymes that can allow, that, allow the zygote to implant. So what the trophoblast is, is this, right? You have many rounds of cell division. From one cell, you're going to make 16 from 16 to 32. Well, what happens is as you have more and more cells, you're gonna have cells on the outside, external, you have cells in the middle and cells in the internal region of our cluster of cells. The cells on the outer edge are called trophoblasts. And they're the ones that secretes HCG. It also secretes proteolytic enzymes. So then you can have the actual, ooh, the fertilized egg, the zygote, implant into the endometrial lining. Perfect then, right? Now this is just a good picture to see. Look at how big the baby gets, right? You can imagine the bladder's right here, right? So this uh, slide shows what happens and who produces hormones, right? Meaning when the, during the first trimester, the main hormone the placenta produces is HCG. HCG keeps the corpus luteum alive in the ovary. That allows us to keep the progesterone levels elevated, right? Again, baby is incredibly small within the first trimester. So it's not gonna be able to produce its own progesterone. After the second trimester, it does produce a combination of HCG, it does produce now its own progesterone, but even that progesterone and estrogen it produces is not high enough, right? It's not great enough. That's why you still have HCG being released. So now we have baby releasing its own progesterone and estrogen. And because it's still releasing HCG, the 
corpus luteum is also producing progesterone and estrogen as well. That's why you see that kind of rise right here. By the end or by the end of the second trimester, start of the third, right? HCG levels completely decline. Why? Because baby and the placenta are now able to produce the vast majority of the estrogen and progesterone. At this point, at the very start and near the middle of the sec, uh, third trimester, baby's near full term, right? Placenta is pretty big. It's able to produce most, almost all of the progesterone and estrogen. Now, at labor and delivery here, take a look what happens, right? At labor and delivery, the progesterone levels level off, right? The estrogen levels spike, and that's the trigger for labor. We talked about in terms of menopause, what happens. And for males, right? For males, obviously the thing we're worried about are prostate cancers, right? In some testes decrease in size, there's a decreased rate of sperm cell production, but keep in mind that even then we will still be producing sperm, right? You will, from the time males hit puberty until death, you will always produce a little bit of sperm. Obviously, when you are younger, you're gonna produce a lot more sperm. As we age, there's a decrease in the rate of production, but you still have production, all right? One of the big things is the prostate, right? As we get older, the prostate increases in size. Now, we could, the most common condition that occurs from this is called BPH, benign, prostate hyperplasia. So what happens with benign prostate hyperplasia is the prostate enlarges. And as it enlarges, the actual urethra going through the prostate, the prostatic urethra, right, starts feeling more pressure from that enlarged prostate. When that happens, it makes it harder for urination. It makes it harder to have sexual reproductive function as well, right? So those are conditions we see as males age. Female, much more market, right? Because of the drop in estrogen and progesterone, there's going to be, right, increased risk of cancers, increased risk as well of MIs and CVAs. Now keep in mind, I said that you have an increased risk in women having myocardial infarcts and strokes and cerebral vascular accidents, right? It increases, but it never gets to the same level as males, right? Males always have higher risk of MIs and CVAs. Even after, when we compare a man and a woman postmenopausally, right? Yes, the you know, probability of having MIs and strokes for a woman increases after menopause, right? But it still doesn't get to the same level as males, the risk factor for males. Right. All right. We're done with chapter 29. Huge chapter.